This is Addison Shonland again, back with our series to talk about leaders in the regional airline business. My guest now is Dan Wolf, CEO of Cape Air out of New England. Thank you, Dan, for spending some time with me. Thank you, Addison. It's wonderful to be here with you. So we, I guess we're, we're moving into a space now where we've seen the TSA numbers looking a bit better this week. But of course, if the economy is in, in absolute tatters. Um, so Brian Burridge from the uh, Royal Aeronautical Society spoke with me a few days, maybe 10 days ago, and he was saying that the world has discovered there's this thin golden thread that goes through the economy called air transportation. And uh, if you take that golden thread away, all kinds of things fall apart. And I think we're, we're experiencing that from, from some perspective here. Well, I, I have to say that I, I look at the TSA numbers as well, because it's a good macro indicator. And of course, we look at our numbers here at Cape Air. And I, I caution the people here, you know, they're high-fiving because yesterday for the first day since this really got going, we flew 300 passengers. We should be flying between 1,500 and 2,000 passengers a day. So that still means, you know, we're down over 80%. The TSA numbers, as, as I'm sure you saw, it's still down 93%, which is better than being down 96% where it was a week ago. Uh, but still, uh, we have a lot of territory to cover in this recovery. Yeah, but I, I think, we're, again, we're all desperate for green shoots, right? That's exactly we're, right. Yes, sir. We're literally down our faces in the ground looking for something to come out. Yes. So it, it seems to me that there's some like broad things that have come out of this. The first thing is, you don't know what something's worth until it gets taken away from you. Yeah. And in the United States, we, we have this great thing about freedom. This word has so many meanings for so many people and our freedom has been taken away. Um, and I think we now know how, how valuable that freedom to get around the country, to go and see things. So we, we, we think that maybe people will pay for travel because they realize how meaningful it is. And then there should be a pent up demand as we go into the summer to go out and see things like new, know, new sunsets and sunrises, new places, new people. So the, the explorer in us wants to get out there. What's your sense of, as we look at the summer, do you think that there could be some way to assuage that need for freedom? Yeah, well, I'm just going to take a step back and just address one of the things you said early, which Nobody is talking about what I'm about to say um, because everybody's focused on public policy misses and trying to blame people for this and that. One of the reasons this uh, pandemic is so bad in the United States is because of the mobility in this country and not just around the United States, but the diversity here, um, our inclusiveness, bringing people from abroad, sending people abroad. As the world became more global, and the United States had a, obviously an important role in that, even though we are only 6% of the world's population, what that did is when we were exposed to this, we were very vulnerable. But one of the reasons we were vulnerable is because of the mobility that, as you point out, we're missing so sorely right now. So I think it is pent-up demand, but it's not just pent-up demand for individuals to experience travel and go to new places. It's pent-up demand because we have built a network over the past uh, decades and generations of really relying on that kind of mobility to have the kind of diversity and inclusion and global economy that I think still is the future, even though I think in the short term, people are looking and saying, well, this is a game changer and it's gonna be permanent. Um, I don't think you can put that genie back in the bottle. We are a smaller planet than we used to be. Uh, I, for one, think that's a good thing. I'm very proud of the role that the airline industry plays in that shrinking planet. I just think now we're going to have to learn new tools and new processes to manage that. So yes, I would agree. There's pent up demand, but I also think there's, you know, people keep saying, are we going to return to some sense of normalcy? No, we're going to learn from this. We're going to go on from it, but we're not going to go on from it by turning the clock back a hundred years to when we weren't connected. We're going to figure out how to connect to each other in ways that are safe, but equally meaningful. Okay, so that, that kind of takes me to uh, the, the other item that's crossed my mind is this whole thing about risk, risk management. I desperately would love, I mean, you can look behind me, you can see all these models. I mean, you know, I'm an air geek and I, and I love the people in the, and the industry. Um, in fact, the, the people are probably more fascinating than the equipment for sure, but I wanna go somewhere. 
and I don't want to pick up an airplane from Baltimore and fly to a big city. Yeah. That scares me. I mean, that, that, it's on the wrong side of the risk profile. On the other hand, I, wouldn't, I would love to go to Nantucket. I would like to go to a smaller place so that I can get that, that ephemeral freedom thing that's hard to define, but you know you, you know you have it when you have it, and you will definitely appreciate it more than you did before. But I need to manage the risk as a traveler. I, I got to figure that I'm not the only person that feels that way. Well, can I if just a little bit of background? So I, I've been a pilot for 43 years. For the first seven or eight years, I was a flight instructor. I'm also a mechanic. Um, I also serve as the chair of the risk committee at one of the largest regional banks. So I've been a bank board member for over 20 years and uh, manage risk. And I think I was put there because of my background in aviation. Of course, Cape Air has a safety management program, a, an SMS uh, program. So as you so rightly gravitate early in this discussion to the concept of risk and understanding risk, what I always taught as a primary flight, flight instructor uh, 40 years ago when I was flight instructing is everything is empirical, everything is statistical. As much as I consider myself to be a poet pilot, I love the aesthetics of flying, I love the freedom, I love the air mobility and the ability to go anywhere in the world quickly. But all of this boils down to statistics. How well did we plan? How well do we understand? Can we put, can we be empirical about all of this? So I would say, Addison, that, that in response to the risk issue, all risk assessment is based on data. It's based on assessing, assimilating, synthesizing data. And the biggest miss we have right now is we simply don't have enough data. So is the risk worth it? Well, I mean, everything in life is a trade-off, right? If we didn't want to take risk as an airline, the easy thing to do is never fly an airplane. And I always say that to our people internally. If we want to absolutely eliminate risk, then let's never fly an airplane. If we eliminate risk in banking, let's not accept any deposit money and let's close the doors. So I think the real question you're getting at is, is the risk worth the benefit? And the, I'd love to just say yes and get people flying again, but I think the real answer to that question is, do we have adequate risk assessment yet? And what's really frustrating to empirical people like myself, who, who really like to be data-driven and science-based and all of that, is how agonizingly slow this is in getting enough data to really assess the risk. So for example, would you go on a cruise ship now? No, oh, I don't know. <laughs> a petri but, dish, a floating petri dish? No, I'm not ready for that. Um, would you, you know, how do you assess the risk getting onto an airplane? Well, the first thing I would do is I'd figure out, okay, who's actually managing that airplane? Do they have something on their website that says what their protocol is? Are their employees going to be wearing masks and, and have a way to, to be, you know, to, to minimize the exposure and risk to me? So as, again, as somebody who's empirical, I want to do that risk assessment, but I think I need more data. And you know everybody is talking about testing. You know, just like sustainability is the catchword of the day, testing is the catchword of the day as it relates to to COVID-19. Um, and I have to say, I think we're overemphasizing. Uh, you know, I think that that's seen as a panacea now, and it's not going to be. But for God's sake, we need data. We need data, and that's that goes right to risk because data and risk are brother and sister to one another. Right. And, and when, I, when I say about the summer, I would imagine that we will have more information as a consumer, as a travel consumer, as a, as a, a travel provider, you obviously have a, a diff, it's like you said, the brother and sister thing, how you see risk, how the traveler sees risk. One of the, the ideas that I'm thinking about in terms of risk is absent perfect information. I might be inclined to say, well, you know what, a trip to Nantucket is a lot less risky than a trip to Boston. And so if I'm gonna spend a weekend away or I'm gonna try something different, I think that taking a small airline like Cape Air to Nantucket seems like a great way to get back into this. And it, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm bringing this up is because we've had lots of conversations with people and it seems to be a very strong theme People are telling us, not the mainland pilots, mainline pilots, but everybody else is saying, 
this thing is going to recover by starting at the regional level. At the, it's going to be a bottom-up swing. That's how this recovery starts. Do you feel that that's a, a, a would you agree with that assessment? Well, I mean, obviously, um, uh, <laughs> uh, not that you're baiting me, um, but I feel like that's a leading question, only that I would love to say yes to that. So you're asking me a very comfortable question because I'd love to see the regionals lead us back in. But here, here's a, a, let me answer a question with a question. Do we know for certain that the reason that some of our smaller communities in Montana, for example, so Cape Air has a hub in Billings and we do five, we serve five small communities in Montana. Do we know that there is less occurrence of coronavirus in Montana because it will never get there? Or do we think it's just delayed? And I'll apply that to Nantucket as well. Right now to the traveler, Nantucket would appear to be a very safe place to go. Very small number of occurrences, very small cases right now of active uh, COVID-19 on Nantucket. Maybe that means that Nantucket has permanently dodged the bullet and it's a safe place to go. Maybe it means that the urban areas where there is a lot uh, faster transmission of it just got it first and have peaked first. And, and that's why, Addison, I, I talked a little bit before about the data. I don't think we know yet. So I think right now, comfortably, people feel like, okay, rural America, small town America, off the beaten path, out of the big cities, where there have been flare-ups, is much safer. It will be interesting if you and I have the opportunity to revisit in, let's say, 10 weeks, if we're still feeling the same way. Um, one of the things that small communities like Nantucket are looking at is by opening our doors in the busy tour tourist season, in the travel season, to people coming from places all over the country, New York, from Boston, from Philadelphia, all up and down the East Coast, Florida, Texas, West Coast. It's a very eclectic summer we have here and we have people from all over the world. How, do, how is that going to play out in the lack of data? Are we gonna be inviting vectors who are gonna infect our community or are we gonna be bringing in the lifeblood to our economy, which it is. And I can tell you that right now here in, on Cape Cod and uh, around the islands in Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, that's exactly what our civic and business and political leaders are discussing, is do we wanna open the doors wide to save our economy at the risk of inviting in the pandemic that we don't know? And I will tell you, I don't think, Addison, I don't think there's an answer to that, do you? Yeah, I, I like the way you did that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't. I, it, it's back to trade-off, right? It's yeah. back to data. If How I swing do my we, arm, my my light will come back on because it's on a motion sensor. So there. <laughs> uh, yeah. So it's a it's it's it is the the multi-billion-dollar question for all of us. At what stage do you throw the switch and and hope that the light's actually going to go on and not hurt you? So here's an interesting sociological phenomenon, right? Our, our region that is leading the recovery right now, as far as the improvement in our employments, is Montana. And part of that is because rural Montana um, has seen less of a flare up, and therefore I think people feel safer. But also the subjective part of it, again, because of the lack of data, is politically, that is a place where probably there is more of the, you know, um, the, the freedom that you mentioned earlier, and this is in front, you know, the, the lockdown is infringing on our constitutional rights to travel. So I think that some of it is a subjective reflection of the politics of the region, more than it is a, an objective reaction to facts and data. So, you know, I, I think that somebody like me who always likes to look for, how do we prove it? You know, um, the old scientific, Western scientific method, right? It's, it's hypothesis, experiment results conclusion we're missing the experiment results part of it and we're going right from hypothesis to conclusion that's a really dangerous place to be when you're trying to defy gravity and run an airline and trying to fix an economy so and that's what i'm saying is non-political and non-partisan it's just sort of true so in the void of that data people kind of gravitate to making up their own reality based on their subjective experience, and also based on what the outcomes wanna be. So the more desperate our economy gets, the more people are gonna to wanna to open the doors to it. But nothing has changed relative to the health risk. What's changed is people are feeling more desperate. And that's a really precarious place for us to be. Right. 
How do you find um, business in the islands where it's much warmer? Uh, from what I've understood, and I'm no scientist, that the virus does not live very successfully in heat. So the, the, again, not, not having the scientific answer to that, I will tell you, our busiest route in the entire company right now is between St. Thomas, U.S. Virgin Islands, and St. Croix, U.S. Virgin Islands. Even though our hub is in San Juan, as you were alluding to earlier, people might be avoiding the hub, but there's certainly very, right now our numbers are actually healthy between St. Thomas and St. Croix. I never would have guessed that. It's the same airplane, it's the same environment. Um, you know, we will see if, if, if this virus, like so many of the flu bugs and other cold viruses, um, is sort of uh, susceptible to being killed off by heat and humidity. One would hope it would be because that way, at least us, those of us in the Northeast, uh, coming into our summer, we'll get a reprieve from it, if not permanent relief from it. But again, we don't know. Our Caribbean is doing better uh, than New England. Our slowest uh, uh, region right now is the Northeast. Um, the busiest is Montana, the Caribbean, and then the Midwest is sort of in the middle. I think the Midwest, we're starting to see some life come back there as well. We have a hub in St. Louis. Right. Uh, I guess um, the, the the next thing is you mentioned an interesting perspective when let's say a traveler goes to the website to see in search of a safe way to travel. What as as in terms of running an airline, what do you do to try and protect your people? And it's not just the people who work for you, but the people who are your customers. How do you do this? It is the most analog business going. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's as close to getting, you sit tight next to somebody. It's as close as you can get to another human being without, sh without hugging them or shaking their hand. That's a really good point. And, you know, as somebody who's a hugger, I'm, I'm sort of reframing my own, my own reality too. It's, it's kind of a sad moment in my, in my life story. Um, we, uh, we stood up a, what we call our COVID-19 task force internally run by our president, Linda Markham. Um, right after this all broke. And we have been having daily meetings, seven days a week, um, embracing the best, best protocols, best practices in the business. So we have done things. I mean, I could go on ad nauseum and more than you'd want, but we have done things like putting sneeze guards at all of our counter to, to be a, a transparent barrier. We, um, consistent with a lot of the industry, are requiring our customers to wear face masks. Until we got to that point, we were actually blocking seats to provide more physical distancing. I call it physical distancing, not social distancing, because I don't want to socially distance, I do want to physically distance. We are sanitizing the airplanes between every flight, so we have ground personnel in, wiping down um, with you know, the, the, the right uh, equipment. We have, uh, so before you get on a Cape Air flight, you will have the opportunity to sanitize with hand sanitizer. You will be required to wear a face mask, our pilots are wearing face masks, our service agents are, our ramp agents are. So we're doing everything we can to not only protect our employees and our customers and our communities, by extension, remember, all of these people are potential vectors. So it's, custom, it's, it's employee, customer, and community um, to physically protect them, but also to give the appearance of it so that people feel safe and they, and they, and they feel like they're working with a company that has really put that as their priority uh, in these really challenging times. So you know, we have a whole protocol, every department, every employee, and again, non-essential people who don't have to be in the office now are all working from home. So a lot of our reservations agents, our administrative people are working from home. But of course, as soon as you go past that, you've got ramp, ticket counter, pilots, mechanics, uh, senior management, we have to be here because we're, we're, we're making those decisions and I think lead by example. Um, so that's a long-winded answer to your question, but it's exhaustive, it's very granular, it's very thorough. And I think there are ways to actually make a difference that way. Dan, last question. I don't know, I'm hoping that you can give me an answer to this one. Could you give us any kind of a, a guide of what does this meaning cost, this extra stuff that has to be done? Maybe in a percentage term per passenger. What does it mean? Uh, per passenger, I mean, I'll, I'll quantify it. Some, some it, again, depending on how many passengers, right? Because the more passengers, the more we can spread the expense out over. Our right. passenger count is down 95% right now. We're flying 5% of who we should be flying. So on a per passenger basis, 
uh, Addison, you could say it's probably adding anywhere from from uh, two to five percent to the ticket cost. It's it's not huge. A lot of the things we're buying are you know um, available in the market. The the face masks that we're handing out are you know the cheap. Uh, I can show you when I I have uh, here. Here's what we're handing out at the ticket counters, uh, and here's what we're, our employees are wearing. So you can see one is sort of the cheap medical version, um, and the other is. Uh, you know, this is to be washed and reused, and this is what we're using, all, all of our employees are using. And, um, you know, it's not that intrusive, and I, I shudder to think that I'm gonna get used to this, but unfortunately, I think around the office here, when I'm out of my office, I'm wearing it, and I think we all will get used to it. But the expense, uh, it's it's certainly a, 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 a doable expense, especially when you compare it with what we had to do after 9-11, for example. The last real seismic impact on the industry um, even though the financial crisis of 2008, 2009 had an impact. The last industry uh, crisis where we had to do seismic changes was 9-11. On a per passenger basis, this is um, more affordable. The problem now is demand. The problem is that you know after 9-11, we sterilized the flight deck, we put flight marshals on the airplanes, we, we ramped up what we're doing at the airports. It was all definable, it was all you know, prescriptive. Uh, right now, there's just so much uncertainty that I think it's unclear uh, when the recovery is going to happen. If we could vaccinate everybody immediately today, I think we'd recover really quickly. But we know that's going to be a process over time, and we're going to have to phase this recovery. So that means we're going to have to, like the other airlines, um, appropriately manage the size of our business so that we ultimately stay in business. Long answer. I'm sorry. I, probably, I can't answer a question short, I guess. <laughs> These weren't meant to be short answers, okay. um, but it's interesting. Two to five percent, and that's manageable, that, and, and you don't pass that on to the customer. No, but not right now we're not, because there's not enough customers to pass it on to. Right. So again, you know, our average ticket price is somewhere in the 100 to 110 dollars. So you're looking at a mask that might cost a dollar and a half, a hand cleaner, the extra work to sanitize the airplane, so maybe you're talking about three or four dollars a passenger. It's not a huge expense. The real expense is not having the passengers here. Right. Well, then here's hoping that uh, if we do talk in 10 weeks time, you have a huge smile on your face because you don't know what to do with all the people that are coming to, uh, to, your, to your airplanes. It's true. I mean, this is a, it's a great unknown. I, I take a lot of peace and comfort in the team here at Cape Air. At a senior level, I'm surrounded with incredible people and right down to the front line. We have about 800 employees. We're an employee owned company. So each one of those employees that's out there uh, trying to protect the customer, the community, uh, each other, uh, have a piece of the action here. And I, I have a lot of comfort in that because I think we'll get through it. Thank you, sir. I appreciate your time. My pleasure. Thank you. We'll talk again, I'm sure, Addison. Have a great afternoon.